Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Cut the Shit, a podcast series that aims to take a closer look at the impact of the IT industry, both the good and the bad. Cut the Shit is brought to you by Plow Networks, a managed IT services company based just outside Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Brian Link, COO here at Plow, and I'll be your host for this series. I'll ask questions, and with the help of our guests, try to dig deep on some of the key challenges we all face dealing with IT. So with that, let's cut the shit and get started. On today's episode, I'm super excited to have Mike Irwin as our guest. Mike is an author and the CEO of the Character and Leadership Center. After graduating from West Point and serving in the military for seven years, Mike got a master's degree from Michigan in positive psychology and began working as a leadership development consultant. He's published two books about leadership and along the way found time to build out two successful nonprofits, not one but two, one focused on veterans' health and one on character education. As if that isn't enough, the guy reads like crazy, he's in amazing physical shape, and he lives on a working farm in North Carolina with his wife and four young children. Bottom line, this dude is freaking amazing, and his thoughts on leadership and how to get the best from yourself and your teams is advice worth hearing. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Mike Irwin. Mike, welcome to Cut the Shit. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, it's so great to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Excellent. Um, you are fortunately, or, or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, one of the few guests we've had who doesn't work in the IT sector or tech sector. So uh, really excited to have you have a kind of a different perspective or different type of conversation today. Um, before we get into the meat of the discussion, I always like to kind of start off with something a little bit different. So um, this is a question I've used a couple of times and, and you know, it's sparked a couple of interesting thoughts. Um, what's an example of the most interesting use of technology, you know, or a hack that you've seen or heard of recently, maybe from a client or a colleague or even in your own personal life? Yeah, I mean, technology, I, I got a very interesting relationship with technology, right, because it is so powerful and transformational, um, you know, and you think about like the journey of all the ways that it's made it easier to get around. I just think about MapQuest versus GPS right now, you know, but certainly, you, you know, I think the, the sort of the topic du jour on technology is open AI and, you know, chat GPT. And, you know, personally have spent some time, you know, playing around with that and just looking at, you know, just how efficient it can be, you know, to help, uh, not when you need, you know, necessarily really creative content, but when you just need more factual based content. Uh, and so, that's that might be like the the lame answer to go go with right now because that's like the topic that I think is on so many people's minds. But yeah, there's just a lot of technology that I see at Team Red, White, and Blue through our app, and specifically, you know, our ability. You know, we've been working on an app and been building it for the past four plus years now, and it's hard. You know, it is really hard to make it the user experience friendly, especially compared to everything else out there. So I would also say some of the developments we've had in the version 3.0 of the Team RWB app. Gotcha. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, let's get to the main event. Um, to get us started, give us kind of a quick thumbnail sketch on your background and kind of your current life slash work situation. Sure. So for me, my story starts in Syracuse, New York. I was born uh, there, central New York back in 1979. So I'm 43 right now. I'm the oldest of four. And, you know, both my parents were cops, police officers. Uh, my mom was actually the first woman police officer in Syracuse PD back in 1974. Um, but neither of my parents went to college and they said, Hey, we really want, you know, our kids to be able to, you know, to go to college in the future. And so, uh, I went to West Point. So I was fortunate enough to get into the United States military Academy at West Point. And my story there was really punctuated by the fact that the beginning of my senior year, nine 11 takes place and, you know, the attacks on American soil and it fundamentally altered certainly like, uh, that day, um, in the immediacy. Um, for everybody to include a lot of our classmates who had family or friends that worked in the Twin Towers or in the Pentagon, but also for the rest of our lives, because it would shape how our our active duty service would be. And so for me, sure. I ended up going into the Army after I graduated and deployed to Iraq in 0405, and then Afghanistan 06, 07, 09. So in that window of time, I served as an intelligence officer for the 1st Cavalry Division and for 3rd Special Forces Group. Um, after that, I took a break and the army sent me to grad school, University of Michigan, where I studied positive psychology and leadership for two years under one of the founders of the field of positive psychology. Went back to West Point where I graduated. So about a decade later, I show up and now I'm Major Irwin, the teacher. So I taught psychology and leadership for three years 
And, uh, and then I wrapped up my time on active duty down at Special Operations Command uh, in Tampa, Florida, and transitioned to civilian life in 2015. So coming up on eight years since I've transitioned to the Army Reserves and civilian life. So I'm still in the Army Reserves where I serve, um, you know, basically a couple of weeks per year instead of right. every single day when I was on active duty. Um, and, and part of that journey as well for me is that, you know, I created uh, Team Red, White, and Blue uh, as the founder of that organization back in 2010, a uh, mission to enrich veterans' lives by forging the leading health and wellness community for veterans. Also, the Positivity Project, which is a character education, social, emotional, leadership, and resilience-based organization where we empower teachers all across the country in about 875 schools to teach their students character. How to be better human beings, in other words, and how to we're, connect. We're going to get to that. Yeah, I want I want to hear more about that for sure. So good. Uh, you yeah, te- absolutely. You teed us up nicely for that. So absolutely. Um, yeah. So that's it. And then, and then you know, on the personal front, is I live outside North Carolina, uh, or I live outside Raleigh, North Carolina, Fort Bragg, and I live on 32 acres uh, and a homestead with my five kids and my wife. Very good. Very good. Um, did you stay in North Carolina? Because that's just where you ended up um, out of nope. out of active out of active duty. How'd when you end I, up in North Carolina? Yeah, well, so I was here at Fort Bragg, two thousand six to nine, and uh, we got married here. My wife and I got married here, and we just loved the area. And so when it came time to leave active duty in Florida, we knew we needed to get further north. And neither of us were a big fan of the heat and humidity. And uh, yeah, we we looked at a bunch of different places, and uh, yeah. Nashville, Charleston. Uh, Charlottesville, but we landed on Moore County um, because, you know, it's just a, it's a really great place to be. Gotcha. Well, I live in Winston-Salem, so I'm just up the road from you, not too nice. far. So um, love Central North Carolina um, like you. Um, all right. I'm going to simplify things a little bit and just say you, you've, you've obviously built a, a career both, uh, you know, when you're in the military um, and now as a civilian, uh, you built that career kind of on on learning and teaching leadership development, right? That's a that's a gross oversimplification, I understand yep. that, but we'll, we'll just go with that if that's okay. And and to get us started kind of down, sort of thinking down this path, can you tell us maybe the first memory you have of a strong leader from your past and what was it about them that stands out? Yeah, so I, I'm a big believer in the power of leadership, have been uh, for a long time. Uh, I actually, my parents saved my, record, uh, my report card from kindergarten. Mrs. Flynn was my teacher and she put there in the comments, um, Mike is a great little boy and one day he will be a leader of men. Uh, you know, she forecasted that back in 1986 and that's pretty cool. I actually wrote that's my cool. statement of purpose when applying to West Point, uh, around this assessment that Mrs. Flynn had of me a long time ago. She saw that leadership potential in me. Um, certainly for my family, you know, my parents are both, you know, two really strong leaders, but, uh, I would say, uh, coach Tom Nyland, uh, he was a Marine, uh, in Vietnam, uh, and, He was my little league baseball coach when I was 10, 11, and 12. And he was just an example of someone who led by example. Uh, He would be out there throwing batting practice, you know, sweating, working really hard, you know, and he'd be pitching to us. But at the same time, you know, he, you know, he really emphasized the importance of hard work and being a good teammate and sacrificing for the good of the team. So he's, he's my answer to that question, uh, Coach Tom Nyland. Gotcha. Yeah. I I mean, I, I would have a similar statement. I think a lot of people who played youth sports, you know, the, those, those coaches are really integral to your life. And if you weren't a sports person, maybe a, a music, uh, a music, you know, instructor, or, uh, you know, if you're totally. into theater, it could be, you know, lots of those kinds of things. Cause they're, they're like your parents, but they're not your parents. So there's something, right. there's something, you know, distinctive about that, I think. Absolutely. Um, okay. Let's fast forward a little and kind of think about today, you know, who are some of your, maybe your leadership mentors or the people you sort of think about when you think about this concept of leadership? So, and, and why, you know, maybe you kind of delve into that a bit. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, mentorship is a really, uh, really interesting topic. One I've been uh, interested in for, for quite a while. Um, you know, I've had the great fortune uh, to have a lot of great mentors in my life, um, and, and especially in the past decade or so. Um, for sure, by far, the greatest example and mentor for me is Jim Collins. Uh, um, if you're a student of leadership, you probably know of Jim, yep. but built to, you know, built to last, good to great. Um, you know, so many great insights into leadership. He was assigned uh, to West Point. Uh, he wasn't assigned because he wasn't on active duty, but he was the class of 1951 chair for the study of leadership. And I was, I was assigned to essentially be his general's aide. And so we would have, we'd have like a meal, sometimes two meals, four times a year. So for two years, so eight times, we had this opportunity to build this really deep relationship with him. 
and ask him questions and get advice. He was not really big on unsolicited advice. He was really good at asking questions. Right. Like, well, what about this? Like, why would you think about transitioning between 35 and 42 to, you know, to the civilian life? Like what more can you get done in seven years versus staying until you're 42 and you retire and then moving on? So he's just really good at asking Socratic questions that would really irritate your mind and get you to think, you right. know? And so having him as a mentor was, was absolutely huge. I certainly had mentors in the military and, you know, some of my commanders were, were incredible. Um, and sometimes people who weren't even the commanders, but they were just in my unit. They were just incredible mentors and they would guide you to see something more clearly to make better decisions without like, you know, sticking your face up in it, you know? So right. Yeah. Um, it's something that I, I continue to think about all the time is how can I be the best mentor possible? And then at the same time, you know, how do I continue to seek out mentors in my life? Cause you're never too old or too experienced to have mentors. Sure. Sure. Um, you mentioned West Point earlier, uh, and I want to kind of sort of turn the focus there just a bit. Um, you obviously attended, um, uh, you know, as a, as an undergrad, well, you don't call yourself an undergrad cadet. there, but you, yeah. yeah, as a cadet, um, you've taught there. It sounds like you've done, I guess, a couple different tours of duty as a, as a teacher. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people, there's a, mis, there's a mystique, uh, about West Point and the Naval, I mean, all the service academies for sure, mm -hmm. but we'll stick with West Point's the oldest. Um, or I think it's the oldest. Yep, pretty sure it is by um, far. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there's a mystique about it. And a lot of people, I think, wonder what the hell is going on over there, right? Like, what is it? What's so special about that place? Not negatively, but just curiosity. Yeah. And so, you know, when you think about the sort of the leadership, learning and training that happens at West Point, um, what is it that regular people ought to understand um, or and, and maybe even consider emulating or adopting in their own life or work? So a big part of West Point's model around developing leaders is this understanding that you can't just read about it or study it. And uh, knowledge is very important, knowing how to be a good leader, but you have to practice it. You know, so experiential learning, and I would argue, by the way, the experiential learning as the world gets more AI and technological and digital and machine learning driven, that that's more important than ever, right? Because intellectual knowledge and, and knowledge about how to do something is great. Um, but at the end of the day, that knowledge doesn't actually convert to anything until it actually does, right? And so West Point's model is really driven by Hey, we're going to put you in, they call it a leadership laboratory. And so for those 47 months, first, you're learning how to follow. Then you're learning how to lead one person. Then you're learning how to lead, you know, a squad of like 10. And so your responsibility climbs, you know, with each year and they give you more and more responsibility as you go. And I think that that sort of crawl, walk, run approach to developing leaders is important. I think often what you see in businesses and beyond is somebody is like a leader or is like a follower. They're a member of the team. And then all of a sudden someone leaves and it's like, oh, here you go. So you go from having zero, you know, zero people underneath you to now having a team of like six or eight. And there's been no crawl, walk, run, you know? And that to me is, I think, a really important insight that I learned from West Point that you have to have a strategy with how you're going to develop people as leaders. The second part of that, you know, is that this idea that leadership development and growth is a journey and there's no like silver bullet. There's no like aha moment. Oh, great. I'm now, I'm now a, you know, a tremendous leader. It takes time. Um, you need the experience like I just talked about. You also do need the growing knowledge. You need to study it. You need to have conversations, listen to podcasts like this, um, read books, read articles. But then you also need two more things. And West Point you know, really drove home. One is you need feedback from people. And two, you need reflection. You need to do so. So you need to look at and study yourself and how you're doing and, and ask yourself those questions internally. Right. But then beyond that, you also need to get feedback from mentors, from leaders, from coaches, uh, you know, from from officers that are above you, from your classmates. Right. So whether that be 360 or peer to peer or people who lead you, you need feedback. Right. And so all those elements are critical developing um, you know, leaders. And West Point does those things exceptionally well over a period of 47 months. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. And, and I think, to, you know, being intentional about it is 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 maybe, you know, what you're saying, right? And 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 being intentional about it for a long time means you've gotten better. They've gotten better and better at over totally. time, right? If you take an 18 or 19 year old coming in, I mean, like, how good of a leader can you possibly be, right? When you're so young and so inexperienced, I mean, it takes time. Um, sure. But but even as you get older and you grow through the you know, and whatever it is, like leadership requires work. Just like you want to be good at your profession in coding, um, in the IT world, um, in sales, in marketing, like you, you have to study it. You have to get experience. Right. Leadership is no different. Like you actually have to work at it. You don't just get better by osmosis. Right. Right. 
So that's a probably good segue into, you know, let's talk some about the character, uh, the character and leadership center uh, of which you're the CEO. Why don't you give us, just give us an elevator pitch for it um, in yeah. terms of the work. Really? So it's centered around the work of uh, the two books that I've co-authored. I started writing both books in 2010 as a grad student. One came out, Lead Yourself First, Inspiring Leadership Through Solitude in 2017. Leadership is a Relationship, How to Put People First in the Digital World came out in 2021. So those books really sit at the foundation. And so there's an element of how do you think, reflect, focus, do those things uh, that require you, know, you to look inward, to be introspective, for you to be reflective. Um, and so that's a big part of the message you know, in one book. And then the other one is centered around, at the end of the day, why is it important to reflect and to think and to focus? Because leadership is ultimately about other people. It's not about you doing something on your own. Uh, it's about working together with others, forging community, building relationships, motivating people towards you know, a, a common set of goals that, that the team or the unit has. And to do that, uh, right, it requires human connection and requires relationships. And so that's sort of the one-two punch of how I think about leadership development and specifically you know, how I work with you know, organizations, everyone from sports teams to individual pro athletes to businesses, government, military units, nonprofits, schools. I really work with people across all these different sectors to, to grow in leadership. And that's the, the framework that I apply. Gotcha. Okay. So, you know, when I think about the title of the company or the name of the company, right, there's a lot of talk about leadership out there. You, I mean, it's a dime a dozen, right? In many ways, you're having to cut through. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of competition to, to, to be noticed when you're talking about leadership. Um, and people don't have a problem talking about leadership, but you've got another word in there called character. Um, and, and that's a word that people maybe don't talk so much about. Uh, and so, you know, how do you suggest folks consider integrating this idea of character and, and maybe either applying it or learning about it and helping others grow into it uh, in the work they do day to day as an employee or manager or a team leader? Great question. So I'd start off by saying, let's, let's give an operational definition of what character is. Yeah. Character is the intersection of your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions that are universally recognized traits for the value that they cultivate in individuals and in groups, right? Positive psychology is that that's how it defines and looks at character. You can go online and find literally millions of memes that talk about what character is what you do when nobody's looking. Sure. That kind of, that's actually the character strength of integrity. Right. Um, integrity is one of 24 character strengths, but right? character is so much deeper than just doing the right thing when no one's looking than, than being nice, which is kindness, um, you know, which is being grateful gratitude, but there's 24 different strengths and attributes. So in other words, character is very complex. And, and I think, uh, until I went to study it in grad school, I had little appreciation for how complex and deep character really is. And so at the core is starting off with an understanding that there are 24 different strengths. Again, they didn't just pull these out of thin air. The academic advisor that I studied under at Michigan, Dr. Chris Peterson, he led a team of uh, dozens of researchers that read everything under the sun, religious, philosophical, mathematical, historical. They read all the major influential works. And then they did what researchers do, which is they classify these different strengths, and then they debated them and adjudicated them, and they landed on 24 character strengths. So that's a long-winded way of saying that it's not easy to grow your character because there's a lot of elements and aspects to it. Um, so I think why is it so important? Because as you look at leadership, uh, we all know this, but you can have examples of people who are very effective leaders at doing very bad things. Sure. Um, you know, the, the most egregious example, of course, that everyone recognizes would be Hitler. Um, but you also have lots of examples of people out there who are, um, you know, using their leadership stool and leadership power to influence people to do the wrong things or bad things, right? There's people who are great leaders, technically great leaders that lead gangs, you right. know? And so the question becomes, how do you point your leadership towards good? And that's really what I'm focused on because I'm a huge believer in what we know from the field of positive psychology. And that is that leadership uh, oriented towards building positive organizations and building character in people is ultimately going to make people, yes, more effective, but also happier and healthier. So, so in your mind, the leadership and character go together in, in some ways. There's a, there's a, there's a symbiotic relationship it. between the two. Can't separate or, well, it. I mean, you can, but, but it's dangerous. <laughs> very, yeah, and, and not good, right? You yeah, know, right. Um, and so it's really trying to say, like, how do we build leaders who have character? And that's 
that at the core is the mission of the United States Military Academy, right? It literally says, you know, our job is to tr educate, train, and inspire the core of cadets to become leaders of character, you know, for the nation, et cetera, et cetera, right? But it's like leaders of character, you know, leaders who have right. those attributes that make them good human beings that are trying to serve the common good. Yeah, my, my, my sense of that is that um, a lot of folks see that as... <clears throat> potentially religious and so mm -hmm. therefore it becomes right we've we're, we're, we're nervous about that sort of thing and so oftentimes it's a whole lot more comfortable to talk about leadership with an assumption that the idea is it's leadership towards good ends but to your point there's no way to guarantee that without thinking about these broad and this is sort of the broader concept uh, thanks yeah. for sharing that because I, I was curious actually so it's really Absolutely. helpful um to me uh I, one of the most interesting aspects of of your approach to leadership really and it, it stems from the 2017 book right Lead Yourself First has as its subtitle, Inspiring Leadership Through Solitude. So this idea of a need for solitude, let's start there. Can you define solitude? And then I want to get into the origin story around why you saw that as so important. So solitude is defined as the psychological space where the mind <laughs> is isolated from inputs from other minds. Uh, it's, it's where the mind is basically free of external distractions. Now, when you go inward, you're going to be distracted by yourself, right? By your own thoughts, you sure. know, squirrel brain. Um, and I think that it's so important to separate it out that this does not mean, you, I say this a lot, you can be on top of Mount Rainier around the middle of the woods, no human being within miles of you. But if you're ripping your, through your Instagram feed or you're listening to a podcast or you're reading a book, that's not solitude. At the same time, you can be in a coffee shop where people are around you and walking around, but if you got your noise canceling headphones on and you're journaling um, or you're uh, making out a plan for what you need to do like next week so that you can hit your goals you know, by the end of next month, that is solitude. Um, and so it, yes, is it aided by your physical location? For sure. If you're out in nature, you're in a place that's very quiet where people aren't around, you can much more easily get to Easier, solitude. Easier, for sure. Right. Yes. But the problem is that you can't get there if you got your phone and you're being distracted by, you know, the text messages and the push notifications yep. and the emails and the phone calls and all that noise. Right. Got it. Got it. And so so this idea of it being so critical, how did you what 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 was it that brought that to the fore in, in terms of in terms of you thinking about it? So uh, 2009, the fall of it, a guy named Bill Dershowitz was a professor at Yale. He came to West Point and he gave a lecture called solitude and leadership. And he turned that lecture into an, an essay um, in some magazine. I can't remember the name of it. And I read it and I shared it out with about a hundred people. And I said, Hey, like this is before, like, I think I was, might've been on Facebook at the time, but like, I, 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 this is when we used to send emails out still a lot that would like be, you know, be big group emails to people. And so I sent it yeah. out. I got like 20 replies from people. Um, it was like by far the highest rate of return that I'd ever received on an email I sent. I was like, wow, that's really interesting. This really hit a chord with people. And you know, the email and the, and the speech is not just about solitude. It's also about courage and having the courage to speak up and to not just fall in line with the bureaucracy and, and what you're told to do. Um, because you know, bureaucracies have reasons. like They, they like people to fall in line and do what they're told to do. Yeah. Um, and very often, that's a problem because what you're being told to do is, is either not good or um, what you're doing is not working. And so you need to have a nonconformist mindset within some people to say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Like, why are we doing the same thing? Why are we doing Iraq? This? Yeah. Yeah. You know, over and over again. Like, and, and so that was where he highlighted General Petraeus and some of the leadership moves that were made in 2007 and eight. So that's, that's where it started. He gave this talk and, and I read it and I said, you know, I should reach out to this guy. So I did, I found his email address at Yale and sent him an email and said, Hey, Bill, this is a really incredible talk you gave really great article. Um, I've got a lot of great feedback on it. I really think you should explore writing a book on this to, to dig deeper. And he, he got back to me a few days later and said, hey, thanks so much for the kind words. And, um, but I'm already working on another book. And oh, by the way, like I don't, I'm not a leadership expert. I gave a talk and I tied this concept to leadership because I was talking at West Point. Um, but, but ultimately, if you, want, if you want to read that book, then I, I think you got to write it yourself. <laughs> and so uh, that sent myself there you and, go. Uh, Ray Kethledge on the journey, which was a six-year journey to be able to to bring it all together. Gotcha. Gotcha. Excellent. All right. Um, you know, obviously IT folks are super busy. Um, and it's the nature of the game. Uh, you know, the, the work is, has a, you know, has a strong mix of planned and unplanned aspects to it, you know, but the reality is so does every, so does every other kind of work. I mean, you know, I, I've haven't spent my whole career in IT. I've worked in it in and out in different places. And, 
and it's not that different than being in other uh, other areas of what I'd call you know what they call knowledge work or yep. office work or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, but when, when thinking about that context and thinking about the folks that are listening to this podcast, what what are some techniques or suggestions that you're giving to folks to help them try to find and create space for solitude? So my favorite thing to break down for people, something I learned back in 2013 from one of my other mentors, Tom Tierney, and that's the Eisenhower box or the Eisenhower matrix. Uh, Stephen Covey has popularized it, right? Is it urgent or not? Is it important or not? Uh, I'll be honest, like, uh, while yes, we're all busy, I, I, I kind of call a bullshit flag on that, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, it's something that. people say, like, it's, it's almost like you're supposed to say it. Oh, so busy. Yeah. Right, so really? busy. You know? Yeah. yeah. And like, yeah. the reason I say that is because like, I know how much thing, how much I've got going on in, like in my own life and the life of people I know. Um, and I also still know where I misuse time, right. Where I, where I squander it. And, um, and so I think that, you know, let's just break it down by the, by the math numbers, right. IT people, I think are ma big math people, right. 168 hours in a week sleep seven hours a night. That gives you 119 hours per week that you're awake. Um, and I, when I ask people, I'm like, is that a little time or a lot of time? Everyone's like, well, uh, if I work 40, even if I work 50 or 60 hours a week, that's still like 60 or 70 or 80 hours that I'm not working. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And so for me, it really becomes a question of, you know, you know, thing number one to do, do the uncomfortable work of going to solitude and reflecting on how you spend your time. If you're not willing to do that, then honestly, like I say, then you're not that serious about maximizing your time and optimizing your performance because you have to be willing to do the uncomfortable work of auditing, auditing your time and realizing in your screen, your, your weekly screen time report or whatever it might be that you spend an hour and a half every day on Instagram, that you spend, you know, X amount of time per day looking at the weather. Right. So everyone's got their thing, right? Like, yeah, some sports, people know what, you know, you're, you're checking out that you're, you're watching sports highlights or reading articles, right? Which I, you may ESPN think is just fine and there's nothing wrong with it, but it's not, it, it's probably not getting into your goals, right? It's definitely entertainment. That's the, that, that's totally. exactly what it is. Right. That's, yeah. And, and it's not saying to be too draconian and too, you know, some people kind of say I'm too intense on this. And I say, it's okay. Like, I'm not saying you shouldn't watch sports or you shouldn't, you know, spend some time, um, you know, uh, on Netflix or other things, but, but be honest with yourself about, you know, how much time you're spending right. there. Right? right. And then when you say, I don't have time for my relationships, or I don't have time to eat healthy or read books or engage in solitude or pray or go to church or any of the things out there that people that we know make us happier and make us better. Yet we often say, ah, I just don't have time for it. I man. don't have time. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I really challenge that to say, um, you know, a more powerful way of looking at that is it's just being honest with you. It's not a high enough priority for me. Yeah. I'm not choosing to change. Something. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Um, as you think about your, you know, the consulting work you've done, uh, and I'm sure by now you've worked with a lot of different folks. Um, I'd love to hear maybe a couple of examples or, or maybe just one of, of where you've seen, you know, kind of really big transitions occur or transformations occur in, in either individuals or organizations. And, and what was it about those situations that really stood out or stands out as you, as you reflect on those? Yeah. I mean, I've done some work with some, some pretty big companies that, just for example, uh, when we were in the room, they would do an they did a, they did a calendar audit of how many hours per week people, you know, senior leaders in this in this Fortune 500 company um, were in meetings, and and the average time was like 34 hours a week. But in other words, like if you're in meetings all day long, if that's what you do, the question now becomes, well, when are you doing the work, right? right. Or is doing meetings work? You know, and and I would suggest that. It's, it contributes to work, but it, it certainly can't be doing the work, you know? It often um, creates work, actually. Totally. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm pretty, you know, again, um, pretty aggressive on this one, too. Like, the, I just think that a lot of people spend a lot of time in meetings because it gives them the ability to, to show people their calendar. And look, I'm, I'm super busy, you know? Um, and it also makes them feel like uh, often if, if they don't have things on their calendar, that somehow that they are going to be seen as not doing work. You know, uh, I talked to my brother about this one time and he's, he's like, uh, yeah, I, I can't really go for a run during lunchtime. I'm like, why not? If you go for a run and you think, and you come up with good solutions to your ideas, I want you running all day long, right? Where, where is this mindset that like, you're somehow like skating out, you know, to go take care of yourself for a half an hour or an hour long run. It's just, it just doesn't make sense. But that's how our mindset has defaulted into thinking is that, you know, unless we're in a meeting or answering emails somehow, then we're, we're not, not working. Being a, 
Yeah, yeah they were not we're working. not productive, whatever that means. And, and actually, it comes back in my mind. You know, not to you know, this is this podcast is about your answers, not yeah. mine. But this idea no, of totally. being productive, like we don't relate a lot of the kinds of work that are, that that happened today, particularly this sort of knowledge office work, right? Is very difficult to define what's yes. pro, how you're productive or not. And so we default to well, how much used to be are they in the office, right? right. Well, if 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 Joe's here early and stays late, he must really be getting after it, even though Joe might not be doing a damn thing that actually helps move the company forward, right? But he's there all the time. Exactly. It's possible. Yeah, um, you know what I think of? I think back to the, uh, you may remember the the Seinfeld episode um, where Costanza, George Costanza's car was broke down and like one boss thought he was like there first thing in the morning and the other one's like, You're, really? Geez, I, his car is here when I'm leaving. You know, Steinbrenner, like he's leaving, you know, and he's like, yeah, well, he's really like, getting after it. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. And, and it turns out he's out gallivanting around town, you know, but that's always one of those funny things that like, like the reason why it's so funny is because we often know that like, it's, it, there's a lot of truth in that, right. That yeah. just because you're in meetings and you're answering emails doesn't mean that you're actually putting in meaningful work that's advancing the mission. For sure. For sure. Um, all right, we've got a little bit of time left. I know I want to be mindful of that. Um, so you mentioned up front a couple of what are, are clearly passion projects for you, the Positivity Project and Project Red, White, and Blue. So you started to talk a little bit about it on the front end, but why don't you kind of recap those for us? And then I, I want to ask you just a bit about it in, in relation to other people, how they think about their own lives. Sure. So Team Red, White, and Blue, uh, founded in 2010, enriching veterans' lives by forging the leading health and wellness community for veterans. Um, you know, really, uh, you know, I was the executive director for a while, and then I was stepped back to the chairman of the board role, and now I'm back as the executive director uh, it's awesome. You know, um, when you think about health and wellness, mental health, physical health, emotional health, they're all kind of tied together, right? If your mental health isn't strong, then like you often lack the energy to go work out. Sure. You're, you respond in a more emotional way. Yep. Um, if you're not, uh, you know, uh, getting your physical health taken care of, then there's adverse effects on your mental health. So health is, you know, holistic health is a passion of mine, you know, and there's a lot of different factors that shape it. Do you have a sense of purpose? Uh, are you part of communities? Do you have strong relationships? Are you active? Um, you know, how are you eating? How are you sleeping? Like there's a lot and yes. it can get pretty overwhelming quickly. And so we're really working with veterans, not just to, um, you know, to forge relationships in their community and to go break a sweat alongside fellow veterans and supporters, you know, wherever they live, but we're also pushing them, you know, to, you know, to, to build those relationships with people, right. And, and to put big goals in front of themselves, physical goals that they have to work towards. Cause we know when you work towards goals with other people, and then you accomplish those goals, like it does incredible things, um, you know? So uh, there's that, you okay. know? Um, and then uh, Positivity Project, you know, founded in 2016. Um, you know, it is, um, my co-founder is uh, two years behind me at West Point. He was an All-American lacrosse player. I was an average baseball player. Um, you know, we stayed in touch during our time over, you know, deployments in Iraq and we were Fort Hood and he was from upstate New York, as was I. And, and we started that really with the goal initially uh, to, uh, to focus on sports. How can you bring character, um, you know, to sports? And my hat right here, you can see like this is this is our logo. It's a shield with uh, a, a plus sign, you know, that stands for positive, right? That forms into a P. But we are, uh, we quickly got feedback from teachers and principals and people saying like, hey, this is, you know, um, you know, this is stuff that students need. How can we bring this focus on positive psychology and the 24 character strengths? And how do we help students build stronger relationships in their lives? Like we need this. And so we grew really from one school in 2016 to hundreds and, and hundreds a couple of years later. And, and, and like I said, our mission really is to partner with schools so that teachers can, can engage their students on the 24 character strengths, one strength at a time, and then overall how to build better relationships in their life. So both organizations are certainly near and dear to my heart, you know, and, and this idea of health, holistic health and wellness and building strong relationships and building more character are things that I've you know, dedicated my life and, and can, will continue to dedicate my life to. Got it. Got it. And so, you know, like I said, I called it a passion project. I feel comfortable with that for you. Um, and, and when you think about that, that idea in your work and you've looked at the organizations that you've worked with and just sort of the broader experiences you've had, you know, in your opinion, how important is it to have a passion project that's focused on giving back? I mean, is that something that ties into broader concepts of leadership? Enormous. Uh, when you look at the positive psychology research, so first of all, number one predictor and number one driver of life satisfaction is the quality of our relationships with other people. Right. So, so that's huge. Um, and coinciding with that is that when we look out for ourselves and this whole message of you do you, right. When we, when we take care of ourselves first and foremost, all the time, 
yes, we need to look out for ourselves. I'm not, don't take me the wrong way. Right. But like when we, when we don't look out for others, when we don't serve a cause much bigger than ourselves, um, that is objectively making the world a better place. It's really hard to be filled up with, with purpose. I mean, the number of people I know who have got so much money, who have had so much success, et cetera, um, but so much of their time and energy has been geared on themselves and how they make themselves better. Um, they're not very happy. They're not very happy. And so, like, again, relationships that we build with people are critical to our happiness and to our health. And over-focusing on our own success is, is very problematic. And this gets into a very tricky space, right? Because if you want to be elite, you want to be great at anything, be it the military, sports, in business, as a leader, you do have to make sacrifices and you have to be willing to set certain things aside. Um, but when you, we become even individual sport athletes, like Apollo Ono, my friend, you know, the, the eight time Olympic medalist, like in speed skating, you talk to people like who, who have been individual athletes, they still will talk to you about how important so many other people in their lives are their trainers, their coaches, their nutritionists, right. their family, right? Like you don't get there on your own. Everything it's a team. It's still a team, even though they're not, everybody's on the field and everyone's not necessarily on the field at the same time. Absolutely. The life's, a team, life's a team sport, you know? Right. And so, uh, you know, so the point is going back to your question is, yeah, you got to find a passion project and that passion project can't be just about advancing your own, you know, your, your own, you know, wealth or your own success. It's got to be about how do I serve? How do I give back to, how do I support those that need my help? Um, cause Oh, by the way, you'll come a point in time in life when you're going to need that yourself. Yeah. I got it. All right. So before I let you go, a couple questions, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll get you to, to sign off with letting us know where people can check you out and find out more about you. So um, I always like to wrap with something sort of personal, and this has been fairly personal already, but more like personal experience. Um, you sound like a guy that's, uh, you, you, you know, I'm I'm older than you, and uh, the, the old Army commercials from when I was a childhood were, we do more before 6 a.m. than you do all day or something. Yeah. It was something along those lines, right? Yeah. Um, which was a great commercial and it showed guys, you know, kicking ass and, you yeah. know, and at dawn, that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm guessing you, you, even though you're, you're, you're limiting your media, you, you read and consume things of, of interest. Tell us about something that you've watched or read lately that you think others ought to check out. Oh, geez. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do. Yes, yeah, so I've got very limited television um, that I watch. I, I, I do some leadership work again, again, the captain of the New York Rangers, Jacob Truba and some other folks. So I've got interest in particular teams or particular athletes, uh, NC State, Virginia Tech men's basketball team, Maryland men's lacrosse team. So um, there's that. But beyond that, you know, I, I think that um, the most pressing thing that we should read um, uh that I read that has really been eye-opening is the book called The Comfort Crisis by Michael Easter. Yep. Um, you know, and if you've read that book or if you just can, can gather the, the theme and the message, right? It's that um, it's really hard to be great at anything when you're pursuing comfort. Uh, the comfort in, 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 in buckets or in spurts is fine, but to pursue a life that's uh, described as being comfortable um, is nothing that I aspire to. You probably have seen some of the quotes from Teddy Roosevelt and others like that, right? I never, never once envied a man who's lived an, an easy life, but you know, yeah. I certainly have envied a man who's overcome adversity and, and overcome trials. Like, so that's what the book is really all about. Like, be very wary of all of the uh, the, the comforts that have been introduced and ushered in in the past, you know, couple of decades, and uh, you know, be sure to guard yourself against that. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I gave uh, I gave signed copies of that book to some people for Christmas this year. Um, nice. It's 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 a it's a really it was a really impactful book for sure. Uh, and two of those people were my children. Um, for, there you go. I have adult children, so um, you know probably hard maybe the hardest project of all is to get your kids to listen to you. Um, you know yeah. because if you if you can if you can win there, you're you're doing something. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm I'm hope I'm I'm a baseball player too, so I'm hoping yeah. I'm you know above the Mendoza line. I'm, I'm working go. on it. So um, last question: uh, Tell us about your first technology memory as a child. Um, it oh, can't geez. be TV or the phone. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think for me, probably the first technology memory um, would probably be, I mean, I mean, I don't know if the VCR is a good enough answer. I mean, I remember, you know, when, you know, there wasn't like, you know, just access to, you know, to everything. And, and so you had to like often like record something and schedule it to go off, yep. you know, yep. and, and sometimes there'd be a big game that I would want to watch or something. And it would be, you know, playing after I went to bed. And so, you know, recording it, figuring out, wow, how does this work? You program it so that it starts recording at nine o'clock on this cassette, you know, and then you got to wake up and hope that it recorded. And then and what the game went long, you might've missed the end of it. <laughs> right. Or yeah, you, you schedule it and it turns out that like, oh, oh my goodness, I lost the end. So, yep. you know, uh, and then also on that is I remember the 19, uh, I think 86 
uh, Chicago Bears maybe won the Super Bowl and they did this thing called the Super Bowl Shuffle. Yes, right? sir. Um, and uh, and I remember like you know wanting like thinking that was the coolest thing, so I, rec- I recorded that and I would I would pull out the old VCR and watch the Bears do the shuffle. So yeah, you should go watch the YouTube video of it. It's pretty funny. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah you can tell yeah. some guys are definitely uncomfortable with uh, being on camera outside of uh, lining yeah. up, you know, putting a hand in the dirt and hitting yeah. somebody. So. Um, well, well, Mike, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, if people want to find out more about you and your work, where should they go check you out? Yeah, so you can go to, you know, I'm, I'm on social media. You know, so I'm on LinkedIn and, and Instagram and Twitter, Irwin, R-W-B. So E-R-W-I-N, R-W-B. And then, yeah, characterleadership.center is the website where a lot of my work, my philosophy on all this is housed. And um, yeah, beyond that, you know, I, uh, I've, I've written some articles out there in my books. You can find yep. those, you know, via Amazon, so. Perfect. Perfect. Well, listen, uh, we'll wrap there and let you get back to work. Uh, Mike, thanks again for taking time to be on Cut the Shit. We really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you're enjoying the podcast, we'd appreciate it if you would become a subscriber wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, that would really help us out. Or you can just go old school and tell your friends, your family, your colleagues, and hell, anybody else who you think might want to hear something like this to listen in. If you're on social media, make sure to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at cuttheshit underscore pod. We are also on TikTok, at cuttheshitpod, all one word, where we post lots of clips from the podcast. And last but not least, you can also watch the YouTube version of the show on our YouTube channel, at Plow Networks. Until next time, take care and have a great day.